Life's the Destiny arrives in Ghana's waters. Rich and Ten's storm affected residents get help, and the wait is over. CPL is here. This is InfoHub Recap. Stay with us for the next half an hour as we take you through major stories covered during the week, August 26 to 30. The future of Guyana has never looked better. Our nation is on the cusp of a development program like never seen before. While Guyana is now emerging, as an energy giant through the discovery of massive reserves of oil and natural gas. It is your government's intention that the huge benefits emerging from this will go where it matters most, to you, the people of this beloved country. There is a surge of confidence in the way Guyana is governed once again, and the level of investor interest is unprecedented. Guyana is poised to become the breadbasket of the region, and the pace at which this nation will grow through prudent fiscal management will be nothing short of impressive. But more than anything else will be the way every Guyanese, regardless of color, class, or creed, becomes a part of this historic period of national transformation, sharing in the wealth and well-being of it all as one Guyana. Thanks for joining us. Ghana's first oil production vessel, the Lisa Destiny, has arrived in the Stabrook block after traveling for nearly 11,000 nautical miles from the Keppel shipyard in Singapore. The country's first floating production storage and offloading vessel arrived in Guyana's waters weeks ahead of its estimated time. ExxonMobil country manager Rod Henson. The Lisa Destiny has finally arrived in Guyana, this world-class vessel that uh, all of Guyana can be proud of. A uh, culmination of over two years of work, millions of man hours of, uh, of effort from people around the globe. Very, very proud of the team to accomplish this feat, this hit this next milestone uh, safely and, uh, and doing it in a way that uh, is protective of the environment. According to the Director of Energy, Dr. Mark Baino, the Lisa Destiny's arrival means that the department's timetable has moved forward and as a policy-related body, the department has to advance their timetable. The arrival of the Lisa Destiny will definitely become a big occasion for Guyana because now it's, not, it's no more just talking about first oil. First oil will now be on the horizon. It means that even for us, we're having, if we were running on a 24-hour clock, we're now having to run, <laughs> if you want to call it, uh, a 24-hour multiply by some fraction. The reality is everything has been advanced because the Lisa Destiny was expected to arrive at the third week of September. So its arrival, which is imminent, would mean that we have moved that timetable time forward. The director of energy said the Lisa Destiny's arrival should engender a new spirit of nationalism, pride, and expectation. Quote, As Guyanese, we should begin to recognize that it is a vessel that will be paid for by Guyanese, pumping Guyanese fuel which will be bringing in revenue for Guyanese to help our country to ultimately be transformed positively from an economic development perspective. It is imperative that as Guyanese, we begin to appreciate that the direct and the indirect benefits that emanate from this sector goes far beyond anything that we have seen thus far. End of quote. The vessel was commissioned by First Lady Mrs. Sandra Granger at a ceremony hosted in June 2019 in Singapore, after which it departed Singapore for Guyana in July. For InfoHub, Anarakan. Executive Vice President of Tula Oil, Ian Cloak, outlined the company's local content plans for Guyana in an exclusive interview with InfoHub. Dr. Cloak describes local content as very important for their operations not only locally but internationally. Uganda, Kenya uh, and Ghana, uh, just to, to use a couple of examples, they're all led by nationals of those countries. So the, the Ghana, we're, we're actually on our second uh, manager of the, of the business there. It's uh, over 90, 80% uh, Ghanaian nationals in there. 
Uganda we run our second manager uh, who leads that business and Kenya run our first one. So that, that is what we do. And uh, a, a successful Guyanan business for us in the future will look very similar to those ones led by a Guyanese. Despite the recent oil find, Tolo is still at the exploration stage of operations and its local office small, manned by an expatriate manager and two Guyanese. We're moving beyond exploration into hopefully appraisal on Jethro. We'll be looking to establish a shore base here um, and we're evaluating uh, some, some uh, submissions on shore base. So that brings our operation on here. We'll look to expand the office here. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, other areas for investment. Um, the, the helicopters will still be used here. Uh, well services companies, so things around the rig that we'll, we'll be making within the contracts, the, uh, the onus on those companies to, to supply them as with, with Guyanese personnel. According to Dr. Tlok, Tolo will open tenders for offshoot offices in the future to as many local companies as possible. On August 12, the UK-based Tolo Oil PLC wholly owned subsidiary Tolo Guyana BV, Jethro One Exploration Well in the Orindo block offshore Guyana discovered oil in commercial quantities. The Jetro 1 well was drilled by the Stenafort drill ship to a depth of 4,400 meters in approximately 1,350 meters of water. The discovery of oil reserves at the Jetro 1 well is the fourth for 2019 and brings the total number of offshore wells to 14. With Elisa Destiny here and the production of First Oil just months away, Director of the Department of Energy, Dr. Mark Bino, has announced the establishment of a local content compliance office. This office will validate information submitted by oil companies operating in Guyana's basin. You would hear often persons speaking about local content and asking us to validate how do you know if Exxon is saying that they have employed 1,357 people who of Guyanese origin were actually employed. We are setting up a local content compliance unit, which will help us to be able to validate and to determine if the information that we're getting from the operators is authentic. He was at the time addressing new students of the University of Guyana's Faculty of Earth and Environmental Sciences during an orientation exercise. According to Oil Now, this announcement comes on the heels of the recently released third draft of the proposed local content policy. The policy stipulates that operators provide yearly local content plans. Additionally, the draft local content policy outlines the expectations that operators and industry players would collaborate with the government to review the local content plans and reports to explore what is working in delivering local content and what can be improved when to make appropriate adjustments to a plan or to government policies or initiatives, and to identify new areas of local content opportunity. The Energy Director also advised the students to think about diversifying their careers. There are a multiplicity of skills and range of expertise that will be required. Yes, there is need for your environmental management specialist. You also had need for people from the Environmental Protection Agency. You also had need for the financial analysts, even the lawyers and the management specialists. And why am I saying this? Because many of us are of the opinion that unless I'm a geological engineer, unless I'm a geologist, unless I'm a mechanical engineer, I will not benefit from oil and gas. And I say you will benefit once you make the sacrifice. For InfoHub, Anarakan. Mining Week kicked off with an annual walk in the capital city under the theme Fostering Respectability and Responsibility in Mining Conduct. Sunday's walk was followed by the Mining and Quarrying Conference and Awards Ceremony at the Pegasus Hotel earlier on Monday. In keeping with this year's theme, Commissioner of the Ghana Geology and Mines Commission, Newell Dennison, says as the GGMC does its own self-examination during this period, it will embrace change and transformation. This year's theme, Fostering Respectability and Responsibility in Mining Conduct, I believe says enough in the vein of what an underlying mindset should be amongst miners and minor folk as the sector is challenged to overcome its constraints 
and limitations. This is vital, for at the same time, we must recognize that there are groundbreaking developments that are reaching into our space, our mining space, and where demands for change will be unavoidable. Isidensen said while some may be anxious about this change, he believes any change could be facilitated in fashion for a successful outcome if tackled collectively. Meantime, delivering the feature address, Minister of Natural Resources Rafa Trochman said the sector has seen much improvement over the years. We have come a long way from the days of river mining when the only means to recover gold was by diving down under the river waters, using only a suction hose to breathe, then digging by hand with a hand spade, filling bags and setting the earth back to the surface. This was an extremely dangerous endeavor, and many divers lost their lives. Today, the mining sector has become more efficient and effective, beginning at the exploration stage where cutting-edge technologies have helped eliminate some of the risks associated with prospecting. Mining Week continues with activities planned throughout the country to celebrate and honor persons in this sector. Felicia Valenzuela, InfoHub. In more news out of the extractive sector, Guyana Goldfields Incorporated, the owner of Aurora Gold Mines, has begun what is being described as successful underground exploration at its northwest Mazaruni location. This follows clearance it received from both the Environmental Protection Agency and the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission. Following a tour of the mine early on Tuesday, Perry Holloway, Senior Vice President, Strategy and Corporate Affairs, told InfoHub that the EPA's clearance gives the company up to 2,500 meters of underground exploration, plus test mining for 300,000 tons of ore. We've started, we've gone down a couple of hundred meters, I think three or 400 meters, a little over 400 meters right now. Everything so far is looking great. In other words, the rocks are cool. Some people thought they'd be hot. There's very little water. Some people thought there'd be a lot of water since we're close to the Kuni River. None of that is true. The conditions are coming out better. Holloway says side drilling will begin soon to determine where and how much gold there is. Meantime, Minister of Natural Resources Rafael Trotman says he is happy with the current progress reports from the company. The minister had previously visited the camp with a South African delegation back in March this year before exploration began. This is uh, historic for Ghana. We've had underground mining in Ghana before. I'm not saying that this is the first, but certainly it's the only company doing it right now. Minister Trotman says he is satisfied that AGM secured the required clearance needed for exploration. And I'm happy to see that uh, issues and some challenges, GGMC, EPA, have been resolved. And so the company has been able to start the exploratory aspect of the digging. And hopefully, as uh, things progress, a full mining permit will be given both by GMC, GGMC, of course, and permission will be given by EPA. Aurora Gold Mines is one of the largest gold mines in Ghana and the world, with an estimated reserve of 6.54 million ounces of gold. Felicia Valenzuela, InfoHub. Wrapping up our look at mining, Friday saw the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding to manage the importation of mercury in the country. With this agreement, Minister of Natural Resources, the Honorable Rafael Trotman, noted that the government will work to protect human life and preserve the environment. We are still on that pathway of making mercury history in Man. The government is steadfast and we continue to preserve and keep the momentum of creating a safe and clean environment and to protect the lives and livelihoods of our people by addressing the dangers of mercury use. The Minamata Convention on Mercury is an international treaty designed to protect human health and the environment from anthropogenic emissions and releases of mercury and mercury compounds. Exposure to mercury, even in small amounts, affects the nervous, digestive and immune systems. It also causes devastating effects to the lungs, kidneys, skin and eyes. Friday's MOU, according to Minister Trotman, will ensure policy coherence through a cross-government approach. By working collaboratively, we will create a platform to build synergies and leverage resources for the national implementation of the Minamata Convention as we proceed and progress on our green state trajectory. 
Responding to reports of mercury being filtered through Ghana to other countries, Minister Trotman assures that the National Registry to be created through this MOU will act as a guard against such activities. The story is, uh, there is uh, I would say some evidence that some of it is moving across. The cumulative effect of having the DGMC mines officers, inspectors from the pesticide board and EPA officers and the core board working in tandem with the police will give us greater impact. Felicia Valenzuela, Info Hub. Earlier this week, the GCAM Chair Retired Justice Claudet Singh announced that the ongoing house-to-house -house registration data is to be merged with existing National Register of Registrants database to produce a credible official list of electors, OLE. Following today's decision, Commissioner Charles Corbin assured that the merger will ensure a credible election process. Of course, because it means that all of the persons who have been registered have actually been verified to exist. Additionally, Corbyn said that a timeline for the way forward will be made available after the commission meets again. So that matter has now been set, the data will be used. How it will be used, the procedures to be followed, and the time it will take to implement those procedures is yet to be determined. Meanwhile, his colleague Vincent Alexander explained that the merging of the new and old data is integral to allowing for a free and fair process. Well, I think what's important in the first instance is that the host-to-host -host information will not be discarded as was required by others, and that that information will be integral uh, to the process. Alexander noted that the government's commissioners respect Justice Claudette Singh's decision and are moving forward accordingly. It's not a matter of what I support, it's a matter of what decision the commission has made. It was pointed out that there are still four days left for persons to get registered. The house to house registration process has so far seen almost 300,000 verified registrants added to the list. Leticia Isaacs for InfoHub. Over in the public health sector, the addition of a child and adolescent psychiatrist has been welcomed. This will cater for more targeted inventions in this area. Dr. Janice October is said to be the first local doctor to provide this specific service to the country. As she prepares to begin her duties, Dr. October said she is eager to work on improving the mental health of children and adolescents countrywide. In this particular area where mental health is concerned, um, we need this speciality is very important because um, before we all become adults, we um, pass, for, pass through stages now. We're children, we're adolescents, and then we become adults. So in order for us to have adults who can um, be an asset to our community and our country as a whole, um, we need to ensure that they're healthy. And health is not only the absence of physical illness, it's also a mental well-being. Child and adolescent psychiatry specifically targets diagnosis, treatment and prevention of mental disorders in children and teens. As Dr. October's skills will be utilized to its fullest potential, there is one other doctor undergoing this specialized training. Also, the Ministry of Public Health will be working to ensure that there will be a cadre of these professionals trained and available in the public health sector. We have a list of areas where we have indicated to our staff within and to several of the ministries that we are looking to train persons in those specific skilled area because either we do not have or the numbers which we have is very inadequate to be able to provide the type of service that we need across our 10 administrative regions. We're hoping that every year we can be able to have persons go on training for the next five years so that we can be able to build our cadre of persons in this particular field. Dr. October met with the Minister of Public Health as she charted her course forward in tandem with the ministry's vision to ensure good health for all Guyanese. For InfoHub, Delicia Haynes. Residents of Karasabai have commended the government's efforts to ensure indigenous land rights and demarcation are realized. As the demarcation process shifts into a higher gear, two sisters welcome this development. I feel we have a right to feel secure and it it's going to benefit us because growing up, 
Amerindians in my village were basically fighting for land title and you know they, they want to know that this land is theirs and I think it is important so we cannot have conflict. We have to know what is ours, what belongs to us. After presenting residents of Karasabai with maps from Guyana Lands and Surveys Commission that showed Karasabai and sections of its neighboring villages, Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Honorable Sidney Alicock, made a petition to the community. So my proposal to you is, I would like you to discuss this, discuss this matter, have it discussed with the UD Tushaus, the DDO, and the Senior Councillor and work towards a date that you might be happy with, that you would be comfortable with, for me to organize the technical team, the surveyors and those other special persons, lands and surveys, our team, GGMC, um, forestry and so on, to be part of that process. Minister Alicock also asks for surrounding communities to be part of the consultation so that there will be no dispute when Karasabai's land is officially demarcated. The residents agree to the consultative approach that will kickstart during Indigenous Heritage Month. 68 communities are on the government's list for demarcation and land titles. Reported from Karasabai with videographer Kenyan Bacchus, Shaquille Bourne, for InfoHub. Meanwhile, the Guyana Water Incorporated's efforts are being intensified to ensure that more hinterland communities benefit from portable water supplies. This was one of several issues disclosed by GWI's Managing Director, Dr. Richard Van West Charles, recently. This comes as the coalition government pushes to reduce inequalities between the coast and hinterland communities. His Excellency has been very clear. Um, that is our president and the need to reduce the inequities between the hinterland regions and the coastal um, and urban areas. And secondly, our government has signed on to the um, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, goal number six speaks of access, um, an equitable access to potable water. And so as we look at the situation, and this corresponds to the mission of GWI and in line with the strategic plan of GWI. The GWI said that following an analysis, the Hinterland Department was established on a firm footing late last year. In the more than 35 communities analyzed, issues such as water access were compounded by climate change effects, particularly from 2017. The sharing of technology with Brazil has also been advantageous. Dr. Van West Charles explained that the Brazilian army engineers recently dug eight wells in the Rupununi. They were able now to find larger amounts of water um, with less challenges than we have on the coast because we found the, the, with the water quality testing that has been done, um, very minimal iron you may find in this water and other metals and it's pure. Um, and so it is less challenging to treat and so we can just proceed to pump it into the distribution system. Challenges due to the terrain and layout of communities are countered by a special modeling to ensure adequate distribution. GWI will also take delivery of two drill rigs before the end of this year. Also, because of a climate change project, change project with um, UNDP, GWI and um, the government of Japan, we are acquiring, uh, and the, the government of Guyana, we are acquiring um, uh, logging equipment which would permit us to do exactly what the Brazilian army did. Paul McAdam for InfoHub. Minister of State, the Honorable Don Hastings Williams, delivered much needed supplies to residents in Region 10 communities who were affected by a recent storm. On Tuesday, the Minister of State, along with Director General of the Civil Defense Commission, Lieutenant Colonel Kester Craig, traveled to several communities in the Upper Demerara, Upper Burbies region, where she handed over building and cleaning supplies to residents who were severely affected by a freak storm last week. As a caring government, we always respond to calls that we receive from our citizens, irrespective of where they live. The communities that were most affected were West Batuka, Mackenzie Central, Blueberry Hill Squatting Area, Silver City, Silvertown, 
One Mile and Victor Valley. Region 10 Regional Chairman Rennes Morian thanked the team for assisting the affected residents. The thing is, based on what has happened, we would have shared with the government the needs of the people. And these things have to be purchased, so we're happy for that. On Sunday, the Civil Defense Commission noted that due to intense rainfall across Region 10 from August 23 to 24, flash floods occurred across the town with Mackenzie and other areas experiencing brief water accumulation. The strong winds resulted in damage to roofs and infrastructure of both businesses and homes. With the new school term just days away, 100 students from Region 4 are now ready to return to school following a back-to-school drive held at the B.V. Kwamino Primary School. Fueling the drive was the importance of school attendance and its relation to improved performance outcomes. The students were outfitted with backpacks, lunch kits, books and other stationery and clothing. Regional Vice Chair Earl Lambert underscored the importance of school attendance. It is important that you have no excuse when it comes to your education. Education is very important, not only to yourself, but to the nation. Free dental and medical checkups were also offered, while another station was set up to provide haircuts and other general grooming of students. Education Officer Shemlin Batson Andrews explained that the Department of Education's aim is to ensure students are well equipped for schools reopening. Without an education, our children would not be able to contribute meaningfully to themselves and moreover to national development. And because the region sees the need and knows the importance of education. The Back to School Drive was a collaboration of the Department of Education Region 4 and the Regional Democratic Council and targeted nursery, primary and secondary school aged children. The almost 1,000 nursery, primary and secondary schools nationwide are on track for opening Monday, September 2, 2019. Natisha Isaacs for InfoHub. Cricket fans, the wait is over. It is confirmed that a much-anticipated 7th Caribbean Premier League tournament will be held in Guyana following the signing of the agreement between the Department of Social Cohesion and CPL. In brief remarks, Minister of Social Cohesion Dr. George Norton said the citizens of Guyana will soon be able to enjoy this beautiful game while cheering on their theme. Cricket is in the air. We know what cricket is to the Guyanese society. And uh, we certainly are glad to be a part of the, this tournament, this annual tournament, um, where persons from all walks of life, from the geographical area, different geographical areas, the different communities, will all come out to enjoy uh, the game of cricket. It was highlighted the team's five-day camp will commence on Friday with a focus on fitness. There will also be game simulation exercises as well as a practice match on September 3rd. Amazon Warriors Operation Manager Omar Khan said selecting Guyana as one of the many to host CPL was in large part due to the huge support shown by the government and its people. The Ghana public, as you know, is enthralled and excited about CPL coming to Ghana. You will see the early excitement, the hype, and everybody's excited now looking for their tickets. People calling, people finding out all our information about CPL. The Amazon Warriors will begin their quest with a three-match home leg at Providence Stadium. On September 5th, they'll take on St. Lucia Zork, then face off with St. Kitts Patriots on the 7th. This is followed by a clash against Barbados Tridents on September 8th. They then head off to play five away games before returning to Guyana for the final two big home matches in early October. Neil Damon, InfoHub. This has been InfoHub Recap, which looked at major stories carried between August 26 to 30. Remember to subscribe to our website for more stories and follow us on our social media platforms. Have a safe and enjoyable weekend. Goodbye.